Hey, do you want to go to Cuckoo's Clubhouse? I'll see you there. Hey, You should have seen the look that I had on my face the first time I saw my tongue do that. I couldn't believe my eyes either. I looked something kind of like this. <laughs> Still there, right up there. I felt it in there. Do not try that at home. But welcome to Cuckoo's Clubhouse. science segment. We're going to go into a dance segment. Yes, as always, I am not the instructor. Do not worry. We're going to bring back the beloved drawing segment. We're going to do a little nature segment and then have a wonderful story that leads into a grand magical finale. Oh, oh boy, I can feel it in the air, guys. It is time for a little Science. About two weeks ago, we had a really bad storm in, in this area. Uh, there was driving rain and high winds that uh, blew down quite a number of, of trees and a lot of branches came down. Uh, and uh, fortunately, no one was inside when this pine tree broke right over the house in Audubon. Uh, perhaps you saw some fallen trees or broken branches in your neighborhood. Like so many of you, we lost our electrical power. Think about that for, for just a moment. We lost the use of our television. We lost our cable. We lost the use of our computer, we lost the internet, no more emails, no more Facebook, no more Google, no more YouTube, no more air conditioning. We lost the use of our refrigerator and our freezer, and after a couple of days, the, the melting ice was dripping water out of the ice dispenser and it was running down the front of our refrigerator, right over the watercolor paintings that our grandchildren had done for us. And we had these bright, multi-colored puddles of water on the kitchen floor. We lost the use of our electric stove. 
we lost our lights. Since we have a well, we lost our water supply, and I had to load up the car with plastic jugs and bring them here to the church to, to fill them up again. Night, we had no lights. It was like camping in our own house. Well, climate scientists tell us that we are likely to have more bad storms like that in the future because of the way the Earth is warming up. The problem is that certain kinds of air pollution, like carbon dioxide, are building up in the atmosphere, causing the global temperatures to rise. Sometimes we call these greenhouse gases. And to show you what happens, I have two identical thermometers. They're both reading the same temperature, about 83 degrees. And I'm going to put them out here in the sunshine. But first, I'm going to put one of them in a clear plastic bag. I close the bag, but because the wind is blowing a little bit, I, I put some rocks around the edges to hold the bag in place. Now, both thermometers have been in the same sunshine for about five minutes. The thermometer in the sunshine has heated up to about 95 degrees. But let's check the one that was in the plastic bag. Well, it's starting to drop once I took it out of the bag. We can see that the temperature was all the way up to 120 degrees. Wow, what a difference in such a short time. Well, global warming is not something to be afraid of, but it is something to be concerned about. Perhaps we'll be able to keep the Earth from heating up by being more careful with the things that cause air pollution, like trucks and, and cars. Perhaps we can build more electric cars and put solar panels on the roof of our homes for electricity. If the world is getting warmer, we may want the shade of trees to keep our houses cool in the summer. But on the other hand, big trees can blow down in storms. So if you become an architect or a builder, you may need to build homes where the roof won't blow off in a high wind. I'm sorry that my generation is leaving you with a world facing such challenges. But you know, challenges help us to grow strong in our thinking and to be the very best that we can be. We may ask God to keep us from having problems, but a more realistic prayer is to ask for God's help in facing our problems and getting through them. Wow. Say, Bernie, did you see how those trees crushed all those buildings? Huh. Well, sure, but I wonder what it would have looked like if it had happened to a shack. What do you mean a shack? What's a shack? Oh, you know, it's a little place where we can get together. Oh, you mean like a love shack? This can mean only one thing. It is time for today's dance lesson. Hi there, it's Miss Lexi, and I'm so excited to dance with you today. We're going to work on a groovy little dance combination, but before we start that, let's warm up. Come into the center of your space. Make sure you can stretch your arms and legs really wide. Jumping jacks, here we go. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stay nice and wide. Reach your arms out like a star. We're gonna go in, here we go. In, reach out, in, reach out, bend your knees. Last one, keep it out, reach out to the side, feel your body lengthen. And then use your tongue to pull up, other side, and up. Arms come down, walk your feet together. And now, bend your knees, reach up towards the sky, and take your fingers from all the way towards your toes. Bend your knees, roll up. Last time, inhale. 
fingertips to reach towards your toes. It's okay if they don't touch. Bend your knees. Roll up. Let's shake out all of your sillies. Let's focus and let's work on this dance. So for today, we are going to start facing this direction. The first thing we do is make a huge sun shake, almost like the sun is setting. So your arm reaches out as your leg reaches out. And then you come down, look up towards me, other side. Arm and leg go together, come down and look. You repeat that, but this time we're gonna spread glitter in front of us. So your foot reaches out as your hands come long. You bring your arms in, and then like your arms are confetti cannons, you shoot them out. And then you go to the other side, reach, spread that glitter, confetti cannons, shoot out. But let's try that from the very beginning. Face the side, ready? Five, six, seven, we go. One, two, three, four. Down, look forward. Other side, one, two, three, four. Down, look forward, glitter. One, two, three, four, in, shoot it out, and one, two, three, four, in, shoot it out. Let's move on from there. We're gonna take ponies, so your feet move quick. We go right, left, right, left, step out, you're gonna point, and then you make three hits. You go one, two, three, almost like a rock star would. Let's add them on from the very top. Face this direction. Five, six, seven, eight. Take it. One, two, three, four. Down. Look up. And one, two, three, four. Down. Look up. Spread the glitter. Two, three, four. In. Confetti. Other side. One, two, three, four. In. Confetti. Pony. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Open. Point M. Rock star, rock star, rock star. From there, we're gonna step clock. We go. Step, clap. Four times. And then you're bringing your hands down in front of you. Like you're spreading that glitter again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's finish off the whole thing. Our arms are gonna move in a circle as we turn to one side. You go one, two, three. Hit, other side. One, two, three. Hit. I think we should try the whole thing. Ready? Five, six, seven, we go. One, two, three, four. Down and look. And one, two, three, four. Down and look. Spread the glitter. One, two, three, four. In. Confetti. One, two, three, four. In. Confetti. Pony. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Step out. And point. Rock star. One, two, three. Step clap. Two, four, six. And let the glitter fall. Let's turn it out. We go over together. Over and hit and left together over and hit pose for everyone take that pose now that's the whole thing and i think that we're ready to try it with the original song so let's get to it all right it's really fun it's really groovy so let me see that energy
grooving with you. And I really hope to see you soon. Keep dancing. Now that was some dancing, but I can't stop thinking about these trees. There's so many types of trees. Carolina Silverbell. Red Maple. Norway Spruce. Flowering Crabapple. Japanese Zelkoba. Kusa Dogwood. Holly Tree. Magnolia Tree. Ginkgo Tree. Gum Tree. Need I go on? I'm running out of fingers here. How are you supposed to tell the difference between all these different types of trees? This is getting drawn out. Hey, that's it. Yes, we will settle the differences between these trees through today's drawing lesson. Enjoy. Hi, welcome back. My name is Athen. Today, I want to show you how to draw a tree. Let's get started. Okay, so to get started with our tree, I'm gonna be using a pencil and a marker. I'm gonna hold off on using the pencil for now, keep it to the side. I've got two pieces of paper here, and that's because I don't want my marker to bleed through to the table. So to start with our tree, we're going to begin drawing the trunk. And I'm gonna start with one line, like that. And my line is a little squiggly and it's not very straight, but that's because trees are a little squiggly and rough looking. So then I'm gonna do the other side of the trunk. My trunk is gonna be kind of short. It's not very long. Next, I'm gonna start drawing some of the branches that come out the side. So this is also gonna be kind of a squiggly line like that. And I'm going to draw the other side of the branch, but I'm going to stop about there. And I'm going to make it go into a Y shape. And then I'm going to come in here and make it so that that branch is coming off of this branch. Next, I'm going to come right up the middle of the tree. I'm going to draw a line like that. And then I'm going to draw another branch that comes out. And you see how all of my branches, they kind of taper, meaning they get closer together as they get towards the end. They go from wide to narrow at the end, wide to a little bit narrower. Next up, I'm gonna draw some of the ground that's underneath the tree. I'm gonna draw the grass that it's sitting on. And to do that, I'm just gonna do some squiggly lines. Next, I'm gonna put away my marker and I'm gonna get out my pencil. And I'm going to sort of sketch out the area where my tree is going to be. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna close off some of these branches a little bit. So I'm gonna do some bubbly lines in a very light pencil because I'm going to erase it later. Now I'm gonna draw the rest of the leaves around the tree and get the general shape. And I'm gonna be using big semicircles and little semicircles together, randomly. The reason I'm doing this in pencil is because I'm gonna to wanna to erase these lines later. So if you mess up, you can always erase a part of your line and start over. And I'm going to go back to my marker and I'm going to use similar squigglies to make my leaves. So I'm going to use, I'm going to start down here and I'm going to just do these little squigglies and I'm going to follow the cloud shapes that I made. And it's okay if these lines 
are a little wacky. Next, I'm gonna go in and do the same thing following these lines as well. The next thing I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna wait a couple seconds to make sure that the marker is completely dry because the next thing I wanna do is go in with my eraser and you can use an eraser like this or a gummy eraser like this or the back of your pencil. I'm gonna be using this eraser because it'll make it a little quicker. And I'm gonna fast forward the video here while I erase. Okay, now that we're done erasing all of the pencil lines, it's time to color. And I'm gonna be using some oil pastels to color in today. And I'm gonna fast forward the video here. I really like oil pastels because the colors are so vibrant. It's okay if you don't have oil pastels at home. Crayons or colored pencils would be great. Even though my tree is a cartoon tree, it's most like a deciduous tree, which drops its leaves in the wintertime. Maybe you want to draw a pine tree, which keeps its needles in the wintertime. Pine trees are shaped more like a cone. My tree is shaped more like broccoli. It's okay if you color outside of the lines because the outline of the tree is really just an impression. It's also okay to leave white spots in your tree because that's sort of like the sun shining through. Some of the leaves are gonna come in front of your trunk and cover it up a little bit. I'm gonna mix in a little bit of blue to add a little difference in value. If I had a darker green, I might use that to give my tree some interesting shapes. Layer colors on top of each other to make new colors. I'm also going to make sure that I color in the grass underneath. I'm going to add some yellow to the grass too. Oil pastels are like a combination between crayons and paint. They're waxy and oily and you can smudge them, which makes your hands pretty messy. I'm going to color in the tree's trunk as well. I'm going to go right over top of my green and blue and yellow. I'm going to use a little bit of black on the sides of the tree to add some shading. Then I'm going to use my finger to smudge it a little bit. This drawing will be a little bit more messy than usual. The next thing I'm going to do is put a light blue background behind my tree for the sky. And then I'm going to smudge it. Of course it's okay if your tree doesn't look like my tree. You can see that my table is a little messy now. And so are my hands. The last thing I do before I finish is I sign my name. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you had fun. Those were some lovely trees. That gets me thinking, Bertie. Whatever happened to the birds that lived in those trees? Birds of a feather stick together. Actually, come to think of it, whatever happened to your friend, the bird? Friend? What friend? You know, the one that dive bombed me last week. Hmm, doesn't ring a bell. Well, I guess we'll never know what became of your friend, the bird. You're lucky you get to live in the cage. I work alone. Well, before I enjoy my sandwich, you folks have the chance to feast your eyes upon these birds that have to actually search for their food. Enjoy.
The red-winged blackbird is considered to be the most common bird in all of North America. It migrates south in the winter, but is often the very first bird coming back to this area sometimes as early as mid-February. When you hear the song of the blackbird, you know that spring isn't too far away. Blackbirds will eat most everything, including insects or seeds. They love to nest in tall grass or the cattails. You'll often see them perched on a, a, a tall piece of grass where they can look around. Uh, the female will lay three to four eggs and they hatch in about two weeks. Then it takes about another two weeks before the young are ready to leave. The most distinctive feature are the bright red shoulder patches that, that the males have. The larger the red patch, the more status the, the bird has. The blue jay is one of the most beautiful of our backyard birds. When you look at the feathers on its wings and its tail, it always reminds me of stained glass, the way it reflects the light in such a beautiful mixture of white and blue. Of course, it has a crest on its head and black markings on its face. A strong bill, which it uses for opening nuts. If you give a blue jay a peanut, which is one of its favorite foods, it'll hold it in its feet and hammer away with the bill until it can extract the, the peanuts. It has a variety of calls, which are very distinctive. A blue jay is a curious, intelligent bird, uh, perhaps one of the most intelligent of, of the common songbirds. It likes to hide nuts and, and food that it'll come back and find and, and eat later. Can be quite aggressive, chasing predators away from their territory, and you will notice that it molts. In other words, it loses all of the feathers on the head before it grows new feathers. One of the magnificent birds we have in this area is the great blue heron. Usually it's found near water, but sometimes near land. This one was hunting grasshoppers out behind the church, but it prefers water where it quietly stalks up on its prey, and with a lightning quick strike of its dagger-like bill, it will skewer little fish or frogs or whatever it is it happens to be hunting. Uh, they like to stand on branches overlooking the water, and they carefully survey the, the water and the area around them, and they are about four feet tall. Uh, when you see them flying, they're easy to spot because their wings are almost six feet in length. When they build a, a nest, well, it doesn't look like much of a nest. It looks like a big tangle of, of, of branches. But there's no place like home, and as long as it holds the eggs and the chicks, well, that's the important thing. And the chicks get very excited when they see a great blue heron overhead or coming near because they, they think it could be their parent coming with a big crop full of food just for them. And each of them wants to be first in line for the, the sushi bar. And uh, you can see these chicks are almost full grown. And then when a parent lands, they stroke its bill and that uh, inspires the parent to regurgitate the, the fish or the frogs or the, what, whatever it is that uh, they're going to be having for, for lunch that day. And uh, they, they, it gets complicated having so many fairly large birds all in one little nest. But somehow they, they struggle and they make it work. Uh, they, like, like any family, they probably have little tiffs, but uh, they work together and they fed and soon the, the little ones will be out on their own, gracing the side of ponds and waterways and sometimes even backyard uh, pools. And uh, you, you may see them there and they're so large they are just unmistakable. They are magnificent birds 
And if you're lucky, when you're driving along and looking out the window, you'll see them silhouetted uh, uh, against the sky or against whatever background they happen to be standing against. It's fascinating how birds get their food. Speaking of which... <laughs> Oh boy, you've really done it now. This reminds me of today's story, which is about a guy that went to the belly of a whale and lived to tell the tale. Enjoy today's story. Hello, my name is Kirsten Potter and I will read you the exciting story of Jonah, are you ready? Here we go. Once many years ago, there lived in a town a little north of Nazareth, a man called Jonah. Here he is, can you see the picture? He was a prophet who loved the Lord and many people came to him for advice and teaching. He loved his people. One day, God said to Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh and give them a message from me. Tell them they are bad, bad people and I am planning to punish them for being so bad. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. The people there were Assyrians and enemies of his people living in Israel. So instead, he tried to run away from God. He went down to the harbor and got on board a ship. See the ship there with its sails? The ship sailed towards a faraway place called Tarshish in the opposite direction from Nineveh. Jonah thought he had gotten away, but God was watching him. God sent a fierce storm the storm crashed down on the ship and huge waves began to push it around. The sailors were very scared. They knew the storm was so unusual, it must have come for a very special reason. The, the sailors thought someone on the ship must be the cause of the storm. Soon the sailors decided that the man to blame for the storm was Jonah, so they came and knocked on his cabin door. Wake up, they cried. Why are you not praying to your God to help us in this storm? Jonah knew the storm was his fault and confessed. I am a prophet of God. I have disobeyed and I'm running away from him. What shall we do? The frightened sailors asked. If you stay on the ship, We'll soon be sinking and we'll all drown. The storm is my fault, said Jonah. Throw me off the ship. The sailors did not want Jonah to die, but to spare their own lives and the ship. They threw him overboard. Immediately, the storm stopped. Jonah sank down, down, down into the sea. All seemed lost. All hope was gone. But God was not finished with Jonah. God made a great fish, which scooped Jonah up in his mouth and swallowed him whole. <laughs> Suddenly, 
Jonah found himself alive again. Only now, he was inside a huge stomach. Where, Where am I? I? Said Jonah. God had shown love and forgiveness to his disobedient prophet. Jonah exclaimed how amazed he was to be alive. He thanked God for rescuing him him from the depths of the sea and promised to do what God wanted in the future. Three days and three nights went by and then God told the great fish to go near land and spit Jonah out, which he did. <coughs> Jonah landed on the sand and walked up the beach, amazed and thankful. When God told him once more to go to Nineveh, this time he did what God wanted and set off at once. He walked up and down the streets of the great city of Nineveh shouting, God is angry with you. If you do not stop being so bad, God will destroy you all. You have 40 days to make up your minds and change your behavior. The king of Nineveh was a wicked man. But when he heard what Jonah was saying, he knew it was a message from God. This man is a prophet of God, thought the king. We better do what he says. The king of Nineveh took off his royal robes and put on old sackcloth garments to show how sorry he was for being so wicked. He gave a royal order. Everyone in Nineveh must stop doing such bad and unfair things, he demanded. Everyone in the city listened and then turned away from their wicked ways. When God saw the people of Nineveh had listened and stopped doing bad things, he decided to forgive them and not punish them. When Jonah heard this, he was very angry. These people are my enemies. I don't want you to spare them, he complained to God. Why do you have to be so kind, so loving, and caring all the time? Don't you think I have the right to care about the people of Nineveh, whom I have created and whom I love? Jonah realized how selfish he had been. That's why he wrote about his adventures in the Bible, to let us know about the tough lessons he learned. God made all of us, and he loves all of us. The city of Nineveh was spared, and Jonah went back to his own country. And what a story he had to tell when he got home. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for the grand finale. The Acme Stork O Matic. I hope your weirdos like that. <laughs> well, thank you for tuning in to Cuckoo's Clubhouse. And as always, don't forget to drop in again next time. Toodles! <laughs> <laughs>